Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, how to upgrade your ethical hacking skills every year by our speaker, Lisa Bob, and I'm Racha and I'll be your host for the day. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few house rules. For our attendees, the session will be in listen only mode and will last for an hour, out of which last 10 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A. If you have any questions during the webinar to organizers or panelists, please post your query in the Q&A window. And if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. An important announcement for certificate of attendance, participants needs to attend the complete webinar to qualify for certificate of attendance. Participants should fill in the survey form in the attendees thank you email and answer the three questions based on the webinar provided with the right answers within the same day. If these two criteria are met, then only the participant will receive the certificate of attendance within five to seven working days after the event. About our speaker, Lisa Bock is an experienced author with a demonstrated history in e-learning. Lisa Bock is a security ambassador with a broad range of IT skills, including experience with ethical hacking, networking, cyber ops, biometrics, and IoT. In addition to being an author for LinkedIn Learning, she is an award-winning speaker who has presented at several national conferences. She holds a Master of Science in Computers and Information Secure System Security and Information Assurance from the University of Maryland Global Campus. Lisa was an associate professor in the IT department at the Pennsylvania College of Technology in Williamsport, PA, until her retirement in 2020. She's involved with various volunteer activity and she and her husband, Mike, enjoys bike riding, watching movies and traveling. So without any further delay, I would like to hand over the session to you, Lisa. Over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Bach and I'm a... Sorry. And I'm a security ambassador. And what I wanted to do is just talk to you about managing risk. One of the things is in an organ, oh, I'm sorry. One of the things in an organization <laughs> is the, hold on one second. Sorry, had some feedback issues. One of the things in an organization is overall risk needs to be managed, meaning we can't eliminate risk. It's, of course, always going to be with us. But we have to take steps in order to monitor, mitigate, reduce the threats that can occur every time, every day, every second. So in order to decrease an organization's risk, we want to make sure that we understand that there are vulnerabilities out there. Now, risk is a function of threat times vulnerabilities. And what does that mean? Well, we know that there is threats and threats exist. Meaning, for example, there's a threat that it's going to rain today. Now, one of the things we understand is that I could be vulnerable, meaning if I don't carry an umbrella, I'm vulnerable and I could get wet. So in order to decrease the risk of me getting wet, I carry an umbrella. Now, threats exist and we can't pretty much do anything about the threats. They are just there, but we can reduce vulnerabilities. Being an ethical hacker means actively testing your system to, to ensure that it's unable to be breached. And there is a lot of things, there's a lot of components with this. Now today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the skills that are required. For example, networking, administration, vulnerability assessment, and then we also have some soft skills. Soft skills include passion. Passion is very important. You want to embrace this whole idea of being an ethical hacking, be curious and want to solve some problems. There's also ethics. Being a certified ethical hacker implies that, but you have to live it. You're going into someone's organization and they need to trust you. You need to trust your team. And those, those components are very important. In addition, there's also communication. And communication within your team is essential as well. Now, I'm kind of thinking that you can see my screen. Um, basically, we're going to just step through some of these things and talk about 
Uh, first of all, we had some introductions, but what I want to just talk about next is becoming a certified ethical hacker, getting some of the core skills, and how you will excel in an ethical hacking career. Then we'll, we'll talk about the certified ethical hacking program uh, from the EC Council. And you're going to feel very confident in learning some of the, the great um, opportunities that you can have because of the type of learning they offer. Then we'll go to the question and answer and discussion period so that you can field some questions and talk with each other. All right, so the first thing is just talking about becoming a, a certified ethical hacker. Now, I'll just take you back to my journey and I've got, I'm going to go back to uh, 2003, 2004. Now, this was a concept of securing systems, which is pretty new in the fact that we moved from you know, uh, going into information technology, gaining information, and then we saw the massive expansion of technology throughout the world. But then we looked at ways that we had to secure the systems. Being that it was such a new field, there was a lot of learning curves that we had to go through. As the time progressed, and I immersed myself in this and then taught that for many years, we saw that there were more and more opportunities for this type of field. It, it, it was one of those journeys like, for example, the, the type of opportunities that you see today and the type of learning wasn't there. So that was the big challenge too in learning all the different tools. They existed, but we weren't really sure how to use them and use them properly and ethically. So one of the things is that you're, you might ask yourself, why am I here? Well, you're probably curious because you want to learn a little bit more about ethical hacking. If you are on LinkedIn, you can take a look at all the jobs on LinkedIn. You just go up to the top, there's an icon that says jobs. And if you type in ethical hacker, as I did, you can see over 1300 jobs. The opportunities are there. I usually tell students, imagine anywhere in the world that you would like to be and put in a job and you know see if there's a job for you. There really is. Now, if you're not really strong in technical skills, that's okay. If you're not really strong in communication, that's okay. The reason I say that is because a lot of times when you are doing certified ethical hacking, you're in a team and they usually want, you know, if there's someone that's really good at um, doing the vulnerability assessment, then we will position them there. But there's also others that are great with communication and writing skills. So you can take a look at some of the opportunities, but the other thing is that you're going to continually evolve your skills because it doesn't really end. It's always a, a changing type of environment. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the opportunities that exist. Now, when we took a look, this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the Occupational Outlook Handbook. This is for information security analysts. And in 2020, the median pay you can see was a pretty decent amount, right? Uh, we also find that the job growth that in the next several years, you're gonna see 33% 30, uh, growth in this industry. So you can't go wrong. And you know, once you take the certified ethical hacking course and get the certification, really the sky's the limit as to what you want to do with your life and the opportunities will continue to exist. So really that's you know one of the first things to just to show you that it's worth taking a look at this. What do you want to do? And as I said, there's an opportunity for pretty much anything that you feel that you would be a good fit in. And when you join a team, it's now uh, remote work is possible. Uh, the, the type of work that, well, for example, in this seminar alone, I know that there are people all over the country and we're able to, to talk with one another. And so don't feel like you have to be in a certain country or a certain you know, community. It's a global world today. So when we talk about how do we get these skills, well, there's a lot of different resources out there. And I'm on LinkedIn and I'm always trying to help others by pointing to resources that are freely available or formally available. Um, the first thing is, of course, there's formal training and college courses or a degree. And certainly you understand that if that does occur, you know, it's not always necessary, but it does help if you, you want to pursue your career and go a little further in management and so forth. But there's also certifying bodies such as Ethic, um, EC Council that provide structured learning. And there's, there's those out there. And as, you can, as we'll talk about, EC Council provides a nice structured way to gain skills in ethical hacking. And in LinkedIn Learning, 
there's tons of uh, courses and other platforms as well where you can go on at your own self-paced and to increase your skills. One place isn't always going to give you everything you need. A lot of times when I tell people to go through, when you're going through a course and you don't understand something, stop and look it up and get a deeper knowledge because you really won't be able to get the big picture until you do gain a skill. And sometimes it's just one simple skill and it might not be uh, clear to you at first, but you know, just go through it again and again until you get it. But you want to make sure you understand the, the foundations and then move from there. We also have a lot of informal uh, training that's available. I know that like on YouTube, there's videos, um, others that share this information. There's also user groups that like either on Facebook or LinkedIn Learning or LinkedIn that will, um, you can get like, you know, people like yourself that you can exchange information, study groups. Also security blogs. Um, try to take a second out of your day every day to just learn what's happening in the world today. Learn what the threats are and learn, you know, because your, your field, your job will evolve over time. For example, in, uh, you know, in the ethical hacking world, we didn't always have the cloud. Now we do. Um, we didn't always have the Internet of Things, but we do because these things exist and are part of our fabric of the world today. So you have to keep updated on the skills. It, it will help you as well as building confidence. And also podcasts. Sometimes if you just listen to podcasts, they're available. If, they, if on LinkedIn you see that there's freely available podcasts or to join one as to the latest threats and vulnerabilities, join it and just listen to see what's new. Uh, I think you'd be surprised as to all of what's available. Now, where are we going to get this information online as far as bodies of you know, uh, organizations? Well, NIST is a lot of different opportunities for you to get uh, you know, papers and documents and ways structured learning in order to get through understanding the process. Um, there's also MITRE ATT&CK, and that's a whole framework of tools and techniques and tactics that are to any operating system. So you have a better understanding of the adversary when you're planning to test and pen test an organization. When also, you know, there's a lot of testing tools out there. Um, one is a Kali Linux. And I had recently found a site that, and I know there's a lot of tools in Kali Linux, but I was amazed as to how many there were. Um, so I, I shared that site so you can just see. So when you get into that tool, Kali Linux, and you you know um, you get it on a virtual machine or your own laptop, experiment with those tools and maybe build a small virtual network on your on your system, and then just uh, go go through and do the exercises. Um, you'll see that the EC Council has virtual labs, but you can also work on your own and and try some of the skills you know that are featured in Kali Linux. Um, another one is Nmap and OpenVAS, and those scanning. You really want to get comfortable with Nmap. It's it's got a lot of different um, opportunities and features and scripts and really powerful. And again, when you're working on your own little system or in a virtual environment to test these tools, you'll be surprised as to how much you're going to be able um, to see with using those tools. Now, when, when we look at the learning model itself, you know, you know you have activities that you want to do. This is a constant everyday challenge yourself. Um, and that's why, you know, when you get in a group of others and you can sort of share information, it's great to challenge one another and talk about that. So when you have interaction, that's another thing is when I tell you about posting a blog or posting a note or sharing a post, improve your, your writing skills and just, you know, share information. Another thing that helps if you are learning something is summarizing what you just learned. For example, you find a, a recent um, you know, article on a current threat or an attack. Take a second, summarize it in about two or three sentences, and then share it on your LinkedIn profile or Facebook group or whatever. That will help you to internalize what has happened and then also improve your writing skills. So interacting and sharing with others is important as well. And getting feedback, you want to see how you're doing. Uh, putting up, you know, trying to go on to online quizzes. And then like the um, EC Council has a lot of opportunities for feedback where you can test and assess yourself and see how strong you are in a certain area. And use those and 
and they uh, sometimes offer you to do it again, do it again. Um, sometimes you get lucky the first time or you really weren't sure of a concept. Try it again. Again, if you're, if you're stuck, go ahead and look at what you, you're uh, weak in. Uh, so then you want to, again, do formal assessments in the form of certification to see how well you can do. And don't be discouraged if the first time you take a certification exam, you don't pass. That happens. You can take it again. And um, sometimes, you know, you just, you know, it just, there was one component that you missed. So don't get discouraged. Try it again. And you want to keep motivated. And what keeps you motivated? Well, if it's the opportunity for a job or attaining the certification or just your self satisfaction, you want to want to know what motivates you to move forward. Now, what are we going to get as far as core skills of becoming an ethical hacker? Now, this is important when I ask, you know, when I get students that want to get involved, you know, they, they just want to really jump right into becoming an ethical hacker. But there's some skills that you really want to get strong in. And one is networking. And when we look at, you know, 40 to 50 percent of what we're doing is involving the network. The others, you know, there's also other things, you know, social engineering, physical security. But networking is kind of the heart of what we're doing is testing. You want to get comfortable with the protocols. Um, why do I say that? Well, those uh, malicious actors out there are looking for ways to shoehorn into the organization. And they look at protocols. They look at some of these protocols that have been around since the early 80s. And how can we leverage those protocols? What weaknesses are there? I'm always surprised at the number of different ways that they're using the different protocols and how they're getting into systems by using, for example, um, an amplification attack using DNS. So those things, you know, learning the protocols, learning well how they work and ways to secure them. Another one is the OSI model. Get really comfortable with that because a lot of times references occur and they talk about the different layers of the OSI model. In fact, there are threats that exist in every layer of the OSI model, every layer. Um, so you want to get comfortable with understanding the OSI model. And also, um, and I say this is a shameless plug packet analysis, as I have immerse myself in becoming an expert in Wireshark and in packet analysis. If you can't see the problem, you can't solve it. So, you know, having the ability to understand and read the data as it's traveling through the network is a very, very good, and uh, you know, something that will help you. Um, you'll see that there's packet analysis and sniffing while you're doing your ethical hacking. And also you want to get comfortable with the cloud and there's resources out there so you can learn a little bit more and gain, gain knowledge in the cloud and uh, the cloud and securing the cloud. So another thing is operating systems. Now, when you think about operating systems, um, you know, there's Windows, Linux and Mac OS and each of them have a little bit of a nuance and, a, and a, you know, when we look at some of the vulnerabilities of each of those, and one being Windows is probably because it's the most widely used operating system in the world today. And Windows, you know, is constantly trying to defend itself, but it is, you know, a target because of the fact that it's so widely used. But in addition, you really want, you know, get comfortable with Linux and using command line uh, in Linux because of the tools that are built into Linux. And Mac OS, um, that's gaining some market share as well. But operating systems, that's another component because you know, you'll be working with those, including mobile devices, when you're doing your ethical hacking. When we also want to do um, pen testing, you know, pen testing uh, techniques, and when we look at some of the security basics, and that one is a CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and that triad and understanding how when we recognize the need to secure our systems and those things are, are essential. Um, you also want to be proficient in cryptography and that takes a while to understand, but um, you can slowly gain skills in cryptography and also some of the weaknesses. Cause we know that when we look at the different services that we provide on the network and that includes confidentiality, integrity, availability, non-repudiation and authentication for the five services that we provide can be protected using cryptography. Um, availability is one that is very difficult to defend against, you know, as far as a denial of service, but the others can be protected using cryptographic skills and techniques. And also, 
when you look at um, the securing a system, it isn't always logical assessment. You may be doing some physical assessment and you may be also uh, doing some social engineering. And um, when we look at how 90, 97% of the attacks that can occur on a network could actually be um, as a result of an email uh, attack, a phishing attack. So you might be involved in doing that and, and running some tests and trying to breach the human firewall. We also um, need to understand the, the concept of risk, threats, and vulnerabilities. And as I said, the, this is a function. Risk is a function of threats times vulnerabilities. They all three work together. But the basic bottom line is if you reduce the vulnerabilities, we then reduce the risk. So in most cases, vulnerabilities can be mitigated in some way, but you need to look for them. Um, some of the tools that are out there. And, and also when you're looking like at um, some articles, look at the way that the ransomware attacks recently have been using Empire um, Bloodhound and Mimikatz and how they're using these tools. So you can understand, oh, well, they're using this. I need to get proficient and see if I can mirror the same attack. So um, reducing the vulnerabilities is key. Now in our security, I just said that security basics, uh, as you said, as I said. Um, but when we also then want to take a look at excelling in an ethical hacking career. Now, when you when you enter into this, your objective maybe is to stand out and getting you know get involved, be a leader, and show that your strength in understanding all of the components. So when we're looking at being curious, what does that mean? Well, you, your job isn't going to just end at getting a certification it continues. So as I said, you want to join a group and learn from others and uh, possibly um, uh, lead a group and interact and, you know, throw some challenges. It's, it's actually makes learning fun. And, and when you get together and you challenge one another and communicate with one another. Um, and when I say communication skills, well, what does that mean? Well, one of the things that constantly uh, fight with and struggle with is when you're a technical person, you don't always have the best communication skills. Um, you're, you're very curious and wanting to do things in the technical area, but you maybe don't have the communication skills. They're very important. The ability to convey information to others on your team, to write succinctly and clearly as to what you saw so that there's no confusion. I mean, when I, I do, I'm on my fifth book now, and when you are writing, um, it's sometimes difficult to start and read it back to yourself and see if they don't understand it. Usually when you're doing your reporting, just state the facts. Don't make anything as far as, um, I think that somebody failed to change their password. Don't, you know, don't state anything about what you think. You're simply going to state the facts as to what you saw. The rest will come in, in the form of the mitigation and some remediation skills. So when you're working on your communication skills, work on writing and also um, speaking. You also, I would tell you to learn additional languages. Um, Python is a great language to learn. It's very flexible. It's almost got like a web-like feeling. Uh, Java and also assembly. And assembly, if you really want to do some malware hunting, learning how assembly works is gonna be a nice skill for you. And then also getting involved. Now bug bounty, and this is something um, that EC Council has is a, a bug bounty program. And there are some of you that I have seen posting on, uh, you know, getting in and doing, getting a triage and bug bounty. This is important. One of the things is that as we know, vulnerabilities exist, but then the larger the company, the bigger the target. And they will continue to try to get into and exploit vulnerabilities within the system. For example, web applications, big target, right? Because of the interface and the worldwide, you know, global nature of it. I have done presentations for many different types of people. And I will tell you that people that do the web applications and interface, it's a difficult job in order to make it functional. Um, so they need support. They need those that can help them to secure their system, to identify the weaknesses and learn you know, what could cripple their system and then able to gain access and then pivot and maneuver through the system. So bug bounty is a program. I think you, know, you, you 
would benefit, you know, from getting involved and just trying, you know, you know, they might not triage your, your, your bog, but it is, it is good to get involved and learn from that. And as I said, writing uh, blogs and posting articles and also capture the flag competitions. A little competition is fun. Getting with your team, preparing for that, and then sort of, again, excelling at each other's skills. What do you, what do you think is going to be the best way to approach this? And coming up with a, what they call a tabletop exercise, and getting your assignment, and then sitting down, you know, um, in a chat and saying, "How are we going to approach this? What's the best way to look at this? And what sh what should we try? We we want to be quiet, and when we get in there, and we want to be able to maneuver through through the system. And so go through it and set through a process using a tabletop exercise, and then just try it. As I said, um, those are those are opportunities. They're out there a lot. And as I said, I think you'll see that EC Council has a little bit of that available as well. So this is a just from their um, website on the Bug Bounty Program. And again, this is something I, I think you would find it would be a valuable to do, to get into. Now, one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that the Certified Ethical Hacking um, from EC Council is um, a now in version 11 it's been through several iterations um and that's what my linkedin learning course is all about is to you know following that learning path and, and being skilled in those areas now when you go through this on ec council um you'll find there's plenty of different um things that are on there that help to strengthen your skills so as you can see within that we're going to we're going to take a look at a number of different learning modules we're looking at you know the social engineering and this is again the weakest link out of an organization. When we look at you know, ethical hacking, it's a holistic approach. And we have to secure a system by covering the different areas, meaning like administrative and you know, hiring someone and making sure that they aren't gonna do anything like crazy because they're, um, they're going through a change in their life. So social engineering is one of those components. Um, vulnerability analysis and trying to to run some exploits is another one and again when you go into a, an organization and you're going to go through an ethical hacking process you'll get uh, you'll sit down with the stakeholders and then they'll tell you what they they're comfortable with you testing um, because of the compliance issues of today this is an exercise that's been going to be required in a lot of places if they're not touched by some compliance regulation yet they probably will be you will see the, the amount of privacy laws and um, you know making sure that the data is protected in some way for example pci dss which is payment card industry data security standard this is not a law it's a guideline or standard developed by the credit card companies that say you must secure your system if you're dealing with individuals' credit cards. Now, for curiosity, I would encourage you to go onto PCI DSS and look at all of the statutes that are involved. I believe that if you can pass the PCI DSS, you're pretty, pretty good in pretty good shape. Um, there's a lot of components to it in securing the data. Um, as I said, this is just um, openly available and you can see what's, what's required. So when they go through, the stakeholders will let you know and give you what's called like a statement of work or something that will show what they want out of this. And then you will go through and uh, test their system. And, and it lasts, you know, how long it will last, it really depends on how big the organization is. So depending on what component and what role you play in that team, you know, there's a lot of opportunity depending on your skills and what you're comfortable with, uh, you, you, you'll see a lot of different things. Um, as, I, as far as, you know, scanning systems and also then going through and then trying to breach the system and hacking into the system. So with the CEH, you also see that it's mapped to NIST and NICE. And that is actually, when you go online, just take a look and see what is required with the NIST NICE framework and see that it is mapped to that. So right there, you see that you have something that's going to be backed by a governing body and organization that structures you know, what is what is supposed to be as far as a secure system. So that's really a strong point. We also see that now the, the version 11 has enhanced cloud coverage, and that's because a lot of things are in the cloud. Cloud is a different beast in that it's almost an abstraction because it's not physically on your network, it's somewhere else, but it is just as vulnerable and if not more. 
So you want to really check to see about that, you know, using the cloud and uh, virtualization and containers and those things in order for you to assess. But there's also malware analysis, and this is where you want to get curious and where you want to have some fun because learning how the malware works and moves through the system, it's amazing. Um, the tools that are available so that you can see exactly what happens when malware gets into your system, where do they go, and what is their objective? And also you're going to see that there's plenty of challenges in labs for you to test yourselves and in a safe environment. Now, again, these are these are done as far as ways to provide you to strengthen your skills. But when you're looking at that, um, understand that these are all virtualized environments. And if for whatever reason, I'm just gonna give you a little hint, if they don't work right, um, you know, ch check with you know, some colleagues and you might wanna tell, you know, um, step through the process on your own to test yourself. But these challenges in labs are really great because they're structured to be almost like an environment that you would work in. So when we're looking at why is the certified ethical hacker in demand globally, well, this is from their website. And you can see the common job roles for the certified ethical hacker. And there's all different types of opportunities. So you, you know, could see that just being an information security analyst is at the basic bottom line you might want to take a look at. And what is that? Well, um, you could be working in a SOC, which is Secure Operations Center, and you could be maybe the, the first level in order to identify possible threats. And then you work your way up as you get stronger in your, in your skills. Um, so you can see security analysts too and others. And then you're know, working actually then as a pen tester and let me just move this over here, junior pen tester. And what does that mean? Well, you're again going to be part of a team where you're given roles and jobs in order for you to achieve as part of the team. And then you communicate with your team in some manner. So also you can see there's plenty of other opportunities there for you. Um, don't, don't think it's just one thing, it's many different things. It really depends on what it is you want to do. Okay, so now at this point, I think we, I think I would open up uh, if you want to ask some questions, um, then we can get some discussion. So, Risha or okay, so there's a question and answers. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, let's get some, you know, yes. discussion. We'll take the question. Thank you very much, Lisa, for an insightful and informative session. That was a very interesting webinar, and I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation by our expert, Lisa, and we hope it was worth your time. For all the attendees, uh, this session is in sync with the EC Council certification CEH. EC Council CEH maps to many ethical hacking roles in the industry like security analyst, information security analyst, certified ethical hacking, security consultant, site administrator, and network management executive. Anyone with CEH certification is eligible for 10,000 plus number of immediate job openings with an average salary of $93,985 per annum. If you're interested to more, no more kindly take part in the poll that's going to be conducted now and let us know your preferred mode of training and we'll reach out to you now we'll take some questions uh, for lisa so lisa a first question is by no this is says that there's a poll do you yes, want them? there's a poll this is for uh, the attendees okay they will... meanwhile we'll take the questions okay so the first question is, how do ethical hackers keep up with malicious hackers regarding the latest vulnerabilities? That's what I talked about. Uh, it, you know, you have to have ongoing learning. The, the landscape of this field changes constantly. As I said, the main reason is profit and they want to get into your system by some means. Um, you know, with the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of concern about, you know, people getting, a, you know, cyber attacks occurring. So you want to keep up with the latest trends and in order for you to see if there is a vulnerability. Um, let's just talk about a zero day vulnerability, first of all. We know that vulnerabilities exist. And when you have any type of software out there that could be a potential vulnerable um, target, you may not, the vendor may not know that that target is vulnerable. 
what happens is that somebody tries to break in and it may not be a bug bounty person, it may just be a malicious actor and they try to discover what is a vulnerable, you know, about the system. In some way, the, the manufacturer, the vendor will find out that there is this vulnerability. Now they work very hard to mitigate that vulnerability and apply a patch, but, but there's a gap between the time that is known and when the patch is applied that it's really vulnerable, it's out there and it's in the wild and you could be attacked. So always be constantly looking to see what's, what's trending as far as vulnerabilities and then research what it is that they're doing. What is the signature? How does this work? And then taking a look at their own systems in order for them to, to see. And that might be part of a blog or something that you can share. So keeping up with the skills is something really important in this field. It's, it's constant. You're uh, always got to be learning. And that's why the curiosity is important. It's not like you just once and done and you're done, you get a certification. You've got to constantly upgrade your skills. Um, and it's not a major, it's just a little slice of time every day to just keep up with certain things. And as I said, that's just one of the, that's one of the jobs that you'll have as far as part of researching in order for you to protect systems. Thank you, Lisa, for answering that question. Uh, the second question is from Daniel Gormley. What would be the difference between shooting for the CH versus the pen test? Well, when you're taking a look at the different, the different types, they're very similar and it's the same objective. So when you're looking at, you know, what is the right fit for you in your learning mode, and certainly when you're looking at EC Council and what their uh, opportunities include, will help you to make a decision. So I, you have to make that decision and look online and see what's the right fit for you. Um, and a lot of times people get one certification, then they stack them against others because you have that base of knowledge. So it's really a personal, you know, opinion and what you want to do. Um, you know, also take a look at what's available as far as the training that you get. So you want something that fits you and that is going to provide the support, the ability to test your skills, to improve your skills. So it's a really, it's an individual. Um, I feel that they're very similar, but again, it's something that's going to be you and what, what fits your lifestyle. Thank you, Lisa. Moving on to the next question. This question is from Pratham. How much percentage of chances are that we could get hacked while penetration testing? What you individually get hacked? Is that what you're saying? I don't understand. Um, I'll just repeat the question again. How much percentage of chances are there that we could get hacked while penetration testing? Okay, I'm not really sure what the question is, but I will tell you that when I have been testing, sometimes I do get do get um, activity coming back. So you know that's again something you have to be careful with. You really don't know what's in the system. Uh, we we think we know and what um, systems you're attacking. Trust yet verify. Make sure where you're going is safe and is part of the part of the ethical hacking statement of work. You may by mistake get into another system. That happens, but you need to notify someone immediately. So you might you know, might face legal consequences. So. Um, you want to be sure you might be in the wrong place uh, and you need to notify someone immediately. For example, you scanned a network that wasn't part of the statement of work and you want to let someone know. So um, the chances of getting hacked uh, by ethical hacking, um, again, I, I would say it really would depend on what it is you're doing and where you're scanning um, and, and only do a scanning that's, you know, that's, a, that's you prove that it's your own system. For example, there's a lot of online scanning opportunities that you can get just to test systems. I always use like Nmap Online just to show people about um, a very simple scan you can do. And then you can use the site example.com. Very, it's open, it, it's allowing you to uh, scan them. And there's also scanme.nmap. Um, I think .org or dot, I think scanme.nmap.org or .com, I forget which one, but but it is a system that Nmap allows you to scan. But just stay away from places you're not supposed to be in. That's bottom line, I would suggest. Thank you, Lisa. I hope Pratham got the answer what he was looking for. 
moving on to the next question. The next question is from Naigim. Can we consider CH as the best certification for professionals without cybersecurity experience to apply for sales and business development careers with cybersecurity solution providers and vendors? When, when we took a look at the opportunities, if you do achieve the certified ethical hacking certification, I really feel that it will open up a world of opportunities for you. Because you took the effort to get a dedicated body of knowledge and you worked very hard, and you will work hard, but that you've done this will show something to a future employer that shows that you were, you're willing to take you know, a time and to deepen your skills. Now, I think in the, in the question, it was about getting an opportunity in sales. Um, yes, I mean, there's a lot of security jobs. Um, I work with a, a couple of companies and doing consulting. And, you know, the folks that are actually in the sales aren't actively ethical hacking, but they're in teaching others. The idea of security is an abstraction to some people. They really don't understand it. So the ability for someone to come in and talk to them, just give them some advice and guidance, and just plain speak is powerful. And they'll feel more comfortable because they can you know, trust you. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 there is a lot of opportunities depending on what direction you want to take. It's not just ethical hacking as we saw from the graphic from EC Council, there are so many different opportunities available to you today. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, moving on to the next question. Are data structures vital in ethical hacking? Is the level of is is the high level of programming skills required in ethical hacking? And learning scripting and languages, I would really encourage you to do. When you're thinking about you know starting out as a, you know like a junior pen tester and you get involved in an organization you'll find that you're going to get strong in certain areas that you gravitate towards. Learning skills, scripting is always a benefit. Learning, you know, basic programming skills is a very important thing to have. So when you're concurrently getting these skills, you know, taking some online courses or something that strengthen your ability to do programming, understanding the, the logic when you're doing some malware analysis and you're also watching and monitoring how someone gets into a system, pivots and moves throughout the system, that ability to understand the logic is going to be a strength to you because you might have to get in and you know mirror a possible exploit. You're, you'll be surprised sometimes when you find or discover the way they got in, you, you'll be like, wow. <laughs> it was sort of surprising how that happened. Um, and then sometimes it's just, such a, an open vulnerability that you're amazed they hadn't gotten in earlier. And then monitoring, as I said, when you go in to do malware analysis and monitoring the logic. So yeah, I would, I would encourage you to, to improve your programming and logic skills. I think that would be a benefit to you. Thank you, Lisa. Moving on to the next question. It's by Rebecca. How important is knowledge of algebra to understand cryptography? Well, when we're looking at, um, you know, um, certificates, you know, when we look at public key infrastructure in itself, uh, PKI, public key infrastructure is not about generating keys. It's about the certificates and issuing the certificates and trusting the objects that are interacting with one another. If there's weaknesses in that system, that's a vulnerability. So understanding, you know, and as I said, that's a that's a path that takes a little bit of time to really uh, assume and understand that. I would encourage you to get as part of understanding the certified ethical hacking certification is cryptography. You want to get strong in those skills because, as I said, ultimately the application is to transfer data securely. So with looking at, you know, PKI and also VPNs and how those weaknesses, you know, in and how they, um, for example, using an older hash, you know, when using SHA and you wouldn't want to use the older hashes, they've been deprecated. So there's newer ones and making sure that the organization is using the strongest cryptographic method possible. Um, they might not get 
you know, attack right away, but there's a potential. That's a vulnerability. So understanding, yeah, understanding cryptographic techniques that could be part of your arsenal and learning, and because you will be testing those as well. That's part of testing and, you know, looking at the cryptographic tools and techniques that the organization is using and are they using the most secure version. And things change as time has passed, you know, even from my first, you know, writing my first book into the next is, is that the cryptographic techniques and algorithms, um, they're actually, look, you know, looking at the ways of protecting it ultimately from, you know, when we're looking at quantum computing, and it isn't just yet, but we're looking down the, down the road as that potential for breaking encryption. We're still, we're still safe, but you want to keep up with that, learn some basics, and then, you know, strengthen those, that knowledge. But yes, that's, that's also important. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, this question is by Dennis. Uh, he says, thank you for the presentation, Lisa. I would like to know what you think about platforms such as Hack the Box, Offsec Vulnerable, VMNs, and other. Oh, they're fun. I would do it, do it. Um, there's different platforms that you can get into, and some are free, which you can just try it, and some are per pay, and some are very reasonably priced for what they offer. I encourage you if you can do those things uh, to get in it's in a safe environment it's step through some of the process and then goal for yourself to get through and move through a system and run the exploits and some of this you know some of the platforms out there they start with real basics and then you move yourself through the program you know i would really i would really encourage that and then when you're, you know, when you achieve a room, then post it and share with others to encourage others. Um, you know, that it's kind of gamed up in that you can feel good about achieving that, but it's building your skills and your confidence. Cause you'll get, you'll get into a situation where you'll think, oh, I don't really know if I can do this, but then you do because of all the practice that you had with those platforms that you building your skills and you will be able to achieve something, um, you'd be surprised, but doing those is a good thing. Now that's, you know, again, one component of doing um, an ethical hacking exercise, but it is a good way to test your skills and get comfortable with different areas. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, the next question is uh, from Lance. What if your role is not mainly focused on security any longer, but you want to continue your CPD to maintain your CEH? How do you recommend to go about that? Oh, um, maybe a job change is what I'm sort of hearing that you're no longer in directly involved. Um, one of the things that I, I think you all know, the security is everyone's business. And if you see something, you should say something. Um, people understand that, but they don't always internalize that but everyone has a potential for allowing a breach to occur. Um, when we're looking, like I said, you always think about logical security and getting into a system, but physical security is one of those things that we had done an exercise to assess all of, all of the different uh, buildings to see if it would be worth putting in a, and it was like a huge amount, $800,000 keyless entry system within the whole facility. and the students went through to do a feasibility analysis and they saw a lot of striking uh, evidence of poor security practices for example panel boxes being in the open doors people holding the doors for you um, equipment in plain sight so the the point and the basic bottom line was that you could install an eight hundred thousand dollar secure system a keyless entry system but if someone holds the door open for you it's all not worth it so you really want to live and practice security skills in your job and to show yourself a value people just forget they get comfortable in an environment and they they feel um that everything's good for example we remember those of you that have been doing this in any length of time uh, the target breach around 2012 target itself was what we call compliant pci dss compliant the building and the organization structure was compliant but what was their downfall well they had partnered with a third party hvac company small small shop meaning uh these folks didn't go and fix a furnace but nationwide if someone in minneapolis their furnace went down they arranged for someone to go and fix the furnace 
Well, they had on their system the ability to drill to the corporate uh, organization, um, and, but they had their weakness was they had malware protection, it was malware bytes, but it was the free version. And malware bytes is great, but where the free version is that it doesn't update you know, your signatures. So um, the malicious actors were able to get into their system and drill down to the corporate offices. My point is that you, you, you've got to remember the peripherals. You have to remember outside of the organization. We are all essentially interconnected. And there's one, um, one of the folks, his name's Dan Staunton, and he is Mr. Supply Chain. Well, he talks about supply chain. And when you think about who your organization is connected to, that could be you know, your weakness. It could be downstream liability that if you get attacked, they'll get attacked. So being of a secure mindset and always keeping your eyes open. For example, uh, if you know one of your partners is using an older version of some software, you need to let them know, we need you to update that. Uh, another thing is really critical is older operating systems. For those of you that use a Windows operating system, um, there's a defender, which is very, very good at defending your system, but you need to, const you know, you should be allowing those updates to occur. Older systems, they don't support modern operating systems, and that could be your weakness because there's tons of them out there, and malicious actors go and seek those um, vulnerable targets. So if you have a job role change where you're not actively involved in security, you still are, and I would always encourage you I'm always amazed when I when I share information and, and, the, and the folks they just oh I didn't know that. Well, just share that information and tell them and be a good steward of your organization and and helping to explain to others why you know why the different things they do can help to secure your system. So you even though you're not actively being a pen test or your ethical hacker, you still could be um, a steward of your organization and an ambassador and to helping to keep your organization secure. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, we'll take two more questions now. Uh, this is from Leonardo. What's your opinion about cyber cyber wall in general? Say it again. I'll repeat it. What's your opinion about cyber wall in general? Cyber war? Wall. Cyber wall. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. What's the best OS to work as a penet penet pen penetration tester? It's by Ricardo. What's best what? OS, operating system, to work as a oh, penetration oh, okay. tester. Um, all right. Um, you probably you know, want to use, I would say, get yourself a dedicated system that has the muscle to do what it is you need to do. Um, you will work directly with folks that have dedicated systems that are beefed up with muscle and RAM and um, processing. Why? Well, some of the scans will be like take hours to do. Um, and you need something that's not gonna crash on you, that can run the whole thing, then run the report, and then you'll be able to analyze it. So, um, when you're working with a team, and most of the time, you, you might have to be doing some research to keep your system updated. But as far as testing, you know, you work with a Linux, you can work with Windows as well, but try to make sure that whatever system you're using has enough muscle and is able to scale up to whatever it is you're going to be testing with. If it's just a small shop and it's a small exercise, that's one thing. But sometimes, you, as I said, you're going to be doing intensive scans that will take hours and your system needs to be designed in order for the, the, the run the scan and run the test and possibly run the exploits. And that again will be this, a lot of times depending on the organization, they've already done that groundwork for you. Uh, but in your own you know, self, you know, get, get a, I have, I'm ashamed to say how many systems I have because I have a lot um, of different operating systems, different versions, different virtual machines, and going back even to some of those <clears throat> Windows XP. Why? Because they're out there. You know, you want to see what things happen. And it's interesting, like we had done, a, we, we tried to run a program, how to write a virus. And with the modern day operating systems are so smart now that even if you, if you put up on like a PowerPoint, right, and you put it on an image, the virus 
the system will do optical character recognition and understand that you have a virus uh, pattern and signature and it'll poof, delete it. So modern operating systems, newer operating systems are self, you know, they're, they're trying to constantly t protect themselves. So working and testing on a different, you know, for you to test with, get the best system that you can, for you to test on, use a variety of systems. You never know when you go into an organization, you might even do what I say is a couple of things, you know, you want a logical drawing, you want to know what, what kind of devices that they have and, and keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of different, you know, operating systems and mobile devices and what are they using. So the more you can play with, the more you can test is going to help you and say, oh, I remember that. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, a, that was a good one and that could happen. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you again to our wonderful speaker, Lisa Bock, for answering those questions and for the great presentation and knowledge shared to the global audiences. It was a pleasure to have you with us and we're really looking for more and more sessions with you, Lisa. Before we conclude the webinar, would you like to give a message to our audience, Lisa? Well, you know, the next steps certainly are up to you, but I'm on LinkedIn and if you have any questions, I know a lot of times people will um, message me. I'd be happy to help. I try to also direct you to resources. Um, I always tell you, let me Google that for you because the resources that are available today are vast. So I would, you know, reach out to me and, you know, if you do achieve a certification, tag me. I want to know and share your joy because it's a, you know, learning is investing in yourself. Um, it's the best gift you can give yourself too, and no one can take it away. So it's really encouraging for me to see that you're interested in, in improving yourself. Um, that's something not everyone wants to do because it does take some energy. But keep in mind that this should be fun. And when we take a look at EC Council's opportunities, you'll see that there's a lot of you know, ways that you can improve your skills and have fun doing it and also um, deepen your knowledge so that you can get a great um, opportunity for a career in security. Thank you, Lisa, again for a wonderful uh, message to the audience. I would also like to thank all, all our attendees who have joined the webinar and took time for the part in CyberTalk series and took part in the poll. Before we end the session, I would like to announce our next CyberTalk session, how SOC can involve, evolve in an era of advanced cyber attacks, which is scheduled for April 6, 2022. The session is an expert presentation by Graham and Thompson, Partner and Chief Information Security Officer at Irwin Mitchell. To register for the session, please go on to our website, www.eccu.edu slash cybertalks. The link is given in the chat section. Hope to see you all on April 6th. And with this, we'll all end the session. You all may can disconnect the line. Thank you, Lisa. Pleasure to have you. Thanks for have joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.